So I want to tell you before we start, I brought some uh, Chinese cultural items. Some are there. So, so Chinese New Year this year is February 10th. It's going to be Dragon Year. So actually, I was born in Dragon Year. So normally, traditionally, for Chinese New Year, auspicious, you hang on your wall or doors. So these are big Chinese characters, and this one just said, uh, like, a uh, which things go well as a uh, um, planned, that means for the new year. So four act, four characters. One shi ru yi. Ten thousand things go smoothly. Ten thousand. <laughs> and uh, this one's the fu dao wo jia. And the happiness arrived at your family. So things go smoothly and happiness for your family. So very auspicious. So for Chinese New Year, you see everybody, they hand up stuff. A everything goes with a pair. So you, you know, you, they like to hand stuff like uh, that, left and right, on the door or on the wall. Uh, and it's always uh, red and gold, quite, quite often. That's the auspicious color always. So I'm going to put here, just make this table look a little bit colorful. <laughs> colorful, yeah. And of course, you got the paper cuts there. And as a part of history, mouse buttons. My husband went to China with me, and he bought some, and people gave him some to collect. Some are collector items now, like a mouse grip leap forward, and the 40 million people starving to death, but on his button say the grip leap forward, so those are cool. And the Chinese coins and Chinese paper money, and the, the calligraphy, when we learn Chinese, we have to practice calligraphy with big brushes and in, in, in school, so when I was growing up, I don't know how many years I had them in my house, but I've been, you know, move around with them and lose some. But whenever, last time I went to China, 2015, I think I probably, you know, bought more stuff. And paper cuts is very traditional too. It's very beautiful paper cuts. It's like a local art. So feel free later to take a look. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Roger's Library. We're very excited and privileged to have Lily here with us this morning. I'm not going to give a big talk or anything. I just want to say that it's very nice to have you, Lily, and we're excited to hear what you have to say. Um, as you probably know, she grew up in communist China, came over here for college, and has been here. And uh, I'm excited for her to share what she has to say. So without further ado, over to Lily. And thank you, Carrie. And uh, um, I think without her, this will not happen. I have been um, offering to go to um, public libraries, charity clubs, churches, and uh, even our schools, middle school and high schools, um, doing my community service to tell my stories, just focus on personal storytelling. And you will notice I have no scripts, no papers. Every picture you see will be a story for me to tell. And uh, so this is my third library talk. So I started in May in my town Ware Library, and uh, I think in October I went to North um, in Bethlehem Library, and uh, so this is my third library. Some libraries said, no, we're not going to have you, and we're trying again for them to reconsider. And uh, thanks, uh, you know, Peter and being here and uh, a volunteer being here to record it. So once we show people this storytelling of growing up in communist China will provide interesting perspective for the local taxpayers, the residents, and even our students. Maybe the words will get out and maybe um, they will say yes eventually, right? I always tell people I just don't take no for answer. <laughs> yeah, just, just keep keep persuading people that's the best. And uh, so, yeah, can you say well now? That's pretty good. Yeah. So you can see that, uh, that that's my title. Is That's what I use when I give educational long parts and talks and focus on my storytelling. And of course, I always tell people, growing up in communist China, I'm based on my personal stories. I'm not going to tell you I will present 1.4 billion Chinese in China. So other people might have their own stories. And the truth is that uh, because I was born into working class family in literary parents and, and very poor, so I will think my story represents, I will say, maybe 90% of people at that time when I was in China because most people were poor. Uh, but if you are like government high officials 
and uh, especially if your parent, parents' position were higher in the Communist Party, maybe their stories might be different. I do have a Chinese girlfriend tell me, live in Wyoming, oh, like uh, my husband's dad was governor of Mongolia. We had plenty of food. We had uh, gifts <laughs> delivered to our door. That's what you get. So it depends on your positions. And of course, my parents, you know, just uh, at the bottom of the food chain because my parents were just regular, you know, state factory workers. So if, how many of you have been to China here? Where do you go? Uh, a, a variety of places, Beijing, Chongqing. Oh, Chongqing, that's where my sister. So which year was that? Uh, we went in 97, we took the, um, the cruise for the Yellow River. Yeah, Yangtze River, River. Yangtze River, yes. Yeah. So, so, so if you look at this uh, Chinese map, of course, China in terms of population, I hope um, it's still the largest country because this is India might pass China very soon. But in terms of geographic area, you know, that is the third largest country in the world in terms of land mass. But um, the economy is the second largest. And when you talk about Chinese, you think about, oh, Chinese are all the same. No, they're not. So Han Chinese are the people like me, look like me, and speak Mandarin, dress up like Mandarin. So that is the group, looks like this. So like that, that's the Han Chinese, which is about 95, 94% of the Chinese inside of China. But uh, there are about 50 minorities in China. So you talk about Uyghurs, you talk about Tibetans, and the Koreans, and Mongolians. There are about 50 if you add all together, some bigger and some smaller. So of course, Tibetans, this is a huge, you look at how big Tibetan is, right? This is a, now this is a Uyghurs, Muslims who live there. When you talk about China, cultural genius right, right now, let's talk about this region. And this is Inner Mongolia, which is next to the country of Mongolia. Then you can see those people and the dress. And they have different language. They have different food diet and custom. And the clothing. And there's a Korean, because they're next to you know, Korean the country. And, uh, and I was born in Sichuan, Chengdu, which is the capital of Sichuan province, and next to Tibet. So I always loved mountains because uh, I was born in the valley and the surrounding Chengdu was all the big tall mountains. And uh, some are very beautiful, but I've never been to Tibet, you know. And uh, I, I want to go someday. And uh, so when I went to college, it's uh, of course East Coast Shanghai, the you know, they, they, they probably second largest city in China, but it's the international commerce city. So when I had a chance to go to college, <coughs> At the age of 17, I wanted to go to Shanghai. I said, oh, Beijing is too, too political, it's capital. And I want to go to Shanghai, more commerce, more international trade, maybe more foreigners there, because I was uh, looking for truth. I want to talk to foreigners. So this is China's, uh, the people of China map, which is to show you the kind of like a um, human geography. I think some high school kids really love this uh, uh, map. And, uh, this is one of the few pictures I took with my parents. And, uh, and that little girl is actually my aunt. So we were so poor, and the government owned everything. So if you want to take a family portrait, you got to go lined up with the cash and go to the little studio to take picture. And my aunt said, I never took pictures. I want to go with you guys. <laughs> so she begged my parents to allow her to join our family to take a portrait and that's me and I'm the oldest child that's my next brother 17 months year, younger than me and later we added another baby brother five years younger than me and that's my dad and my mom 
I wrote a, a special tribute to my father, my mother for Mother's Day, Father's Day. I think all published as op-ed and tell their special stories. So basically my dad, my mom, and, and uh, were, my dad was illiterate. My mom had an elementary school education. But my mom was a pre, like a preemie baby, almost died. And uh, so she, she was kind of miracle, did not die. And, and, but she was born with lots of health issues. She, she nearsighted and um, and very small. And uh, then my dad was like a, one of the seven children. But then because he, he lost his both parents when he was a, a five years old, so he become orphan, and he was adopted by his uncle, who did not have children, to say, okay, if we adopt you, those in the Sichuan Mountains, then you have to work hard, and then we don't have money for you to go to school. That's why my dad did not, you know, and could not read, even today, in Chinese. I mean, my dad is 80, 80, you know, five years old, 87 years old now. I mean, Chinese government screwed up his birthday. His birthday on paper said 85, during the Cultural Revolution, it was totally chaotic, so somehow his birthday got delayed for two years. <laughs> he keeps saying, I'm 87 today, not 85. He looked pretty good for his age, you know? And uh, so so what happens uh, under communist China is everybody worked for state, everybody had to work for the state. And uh, if you're a mother, you say, I don't want to work, I want to stay home with my baby, with my children. No, you can't. You don't have that choice. You must work. You get a guaranteed a state factory job. And, but the productive, productivity is not the same. Um, and so, so there's no choice. So all the infants are supposed to go to a state factory daycare. And uh, I remember that my baby brother, I mean, when he was born, they did not want to, him and to go to daycare because they couldn't afford it. And I was six years old. I'm supposed to go to school. So I had to be begged by my parents to delay my school year to stay home to babysit him because they said, we just cannot afford it because my parents' salaries were pretty low. See, so even though they won't work six days a week, we went to school six days a week. But they could not, you know, make enough money for us to be fit. I mean, so you wonder where's the productivity that in the whole country economy was is a very bad shape. And um, so when I was born, um, it was just right before the Cultural Revolution, Mao's Cultural Revolution. And um, this is just from the internet and. Uh, I even did not know what I was born into means. This I had no idea. So this is my summary of his cultural revolution. Because I grew up there from two years old to twelve years old under that regime. So so basically Mao was China's like supreme leader, but because he's a great leap forward, on his button here, one of the buttons is great leap forward, where mass filming happened, so he lost some power. And we then there was a new president called the New South Chi. And New South Chi was in charge of China's economy, and Mao was marginalized, and he really resented that because he lost some power inside of the only party, CCP the China Communist Party. So he traveled outside of Beijing to talk to college students and um, to basically calling for a cultural revolution. So fundamentally, I did not know that until I come to the United States. He wanted to gain his power back and purge his political competitors, enemies like Liu Shaoqi and his supporters. So he called those people, labeled them revisionists. They want to go back to old China. So we they represent old China. That's why we need to start cultural revolution. So destroy four old. So that's four old means old traditional ideas, culture, habits, and customs. So for example, what is a four old? Like a, this is a traditional brocade Chinese jacket. 
it's considered to be old culture because that's from Qing Dynasty. It's pretty, it's uh, and beautiful, it represents old. And uh, you keep them, wear them, and you will be demonized. So it was basically banned. You should not wear anything old like that. And the red guards were going door to door, looting and searching for old stuff like uh, old furniture, old books, diaries, clothing, and, uh, and cultural relics. You need to hide them, burn them, or give away because if you are found, you possess those things, you can get into trouble. And uh, I remember my grandma had to hide a couple of things, and but they took my grandma's sewing machine because uh, you know that's supposed to be old or something, and uh, so we 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 end up to be no good clothes. Uh, you know, once a year we get one piece of new clothes and save whole year. Otherwise, your pants were like full of holes and get patches on and, and pass down. You know, I'm a girl, but my clothes can pass down to my Next brother was a boy, it doesn't matter because you were poor, you couldn't, you know, and you really wear right clothes anyway. So it's good, you just have pants without, you know, patches on it. And so we're going to talk about more, um, you know, how, how life was like and during the most um, cultural revolution. And this is it food rationing coupon from every local government. This is from Heilongjiang, which is northeast China, the, the big province um, in China, food rationing coupon. Here it says 1978. Actually, it was donated to me from an American friend who went to China that time and brought back the food rationing coupon as uh, evidence, and as a souvenir. He said, Lily, do you, do, you, do you want one? I said, of course, I didn't have one. You know, I never had those things in, in 1978. I was still pretty young. So he texted me and, and gave me the, this, uh, this uh, uh, emailed me this uh, um, picture. So every, you know, that's like after mouse death. Well, even after mouse, mouse death, we still had the food rationing coupons. There's just not enough food, not enough any products, so you got to live on rationing. So give you an idea how much food my family of five should eat um, based on, you know, my father's factory status, which is the worker status. So for all the proteins, include all the eggs, meat, and, and is, uh, I think 2.8 pounds per month, per month for family of five. So you can see how hungry we were, right? <laughs> That's why people are always kidding me. It's like, uh, are you a vegetarian? And I say, oh, no, hell no. I, I was dreaming about meat every night <laughs> when I was a child. I want to have a big piece of meat, you know, like a Chinese stir fry or something. So for everything from rice and sugar, protein, and the milk, even fabrics. How much fabric you can buy to so close for your kids are rationed, were rationed. That's how bad the economy was. And um, I remember I labor, I smelled um, milk, like my next door labor, their position were higher in the factory. They were boiling milk with milk powder mixed up and boiling. You had a smell so good because we did not have milk to drink. I always thought I could be two inches taller if I had a better nutrition. <laughs> I'm five one, you know. <laughs> and uh, see, that's me. Here's a little girl. No red scarf. I was very upset. I was the best student. So after I stayed home, babysit for a year because my parents baked me, they were poor. I become such a motivated student. I made 100% on all my subjects in schools, from physical education to character education, which is a political um, education, and to my Chinese and math and school work, 100%. I had a good memory, even though my my parents were illiterate, but I was born with a very good memory. And uh, I just thought I would be the best student and be the first one to wear a red scarf. But uh, my teacher heard from my girlfriend who reported on me to say, Lily is a, a 
um, kind of cocky, too confident. She bragged about she would be the first one to be nominated to join Mao's grassroots student organization, Young Pioneer, like the first group to wear red scarf. My teacher said, that you, you, you are too full of yourself, so I'm not going to nominate you. And you have to prove yourself or you are part of the group. You, you are like everybody else. Be humble. Oh, I, I was very upset. And uh, my parents agreed with my teacher because my parents were brainwashed. And, you know, they were red workers. And uh, I said, oh, I better not trust my girlfriends. Don't trust anybody. Because I got reported on when I was seven years old. <laughs> like, I was too confident. I was too expressive. So I learned at the age of seven, don't trust anybody. And don't even trust your girlfriends. Don't trust your family members. And uh, that's what they do. I mean, they encourage everybody to report on everybody. So, but I wasn't happy, but you can see I was wearing my only good pants and checker box pants, uh, probably got from Chinese New Year because people ask me, why are you wearing checker box pants, Lydia? I said, that was my best pants. <laughs> and uh, then all those girls, friends, one, two, three, four, five, six, were the first group joining the Young Pioneer group. Have anybody read the Red Scarf story? And uh, I, I can identify with that a lot. So I swear to myself, don't trust anybody, but keep everything to myself. I'm going to join Young Pioneer as soon as I correct myself <laughs> because I was very competitive I want to be the best of the best I, I guess that's just in my blood I want to be the best student you know I want to wear that red scarf because it's privilege you are chew my mouth young pioneer you know red scarf by the way when Mao divided people from a presser versus a press it's a five red classes like my parents and five black classes if you were born five black classes, like the rightist, the rich farmers, landlords, and the bad influencers, county revolutionaries. It's very fluid, you know, subjective category. And you can never wear red scarf. But I was a red class, red peasants, you know, parents or workers, and you know, cannot be more red than them except peasants. Um, but the workers were red class. I should wear the red scarf, no problem. I just was delayed by my teacher because uh, I was not being politically correct. I was uh, bragging about myself. So I said, I'm going to improve. And uh, so I did wear a red scarf one year later. And later, I become red guard. Uh, in middle school, high school, that's the organization under Mao. You can become a red guard. Except that we, I was wearing this, a little plaque, says the Hong Wei Bi, that means red guard. And, uh, and, and the typical outfit, it's a white shirt with a green jacket outside. We had a proof hairstyle, so your hairs cannot just be laying down like what I have today, past your shoulder. You have to do braids, ponytails, or unisex boy style. I mean, like a, so there's a certain approved hairstyles. And uh, you cannot just choose you know, whatever pretty you want to wear. And anything that's too pretty, might be four olds, or you want to look pretty and sexy, and that's politically incorrect, because we're not even allowed to date. Why do you want to dress up like pretty clothes? And so it's better. Everybody just look pretty and pretty same and unisex. And so you see that uh, uh, this is typical middle school marching. I, you know, just imagine I was marching just like one of the students, and you hold the Chimai Mouse little red book, and the marks leaning mouse portraits and you march and normally at the same time they will ask you to sing a song, read a song and uh, non live to my mouth you know, communism you know, uh, it's good for everybody stuff like that and uh, so normally it's uh, four five communist leaders portraits you hold Marx, Angus, Lenin Stalin and Mao so you can see Mao portraits back there and uh, all the red flags and slow Guns and uh, you know all the kids and brainwashed. They just hold us. So you chant when you when you march. And when you go through military like a camp or something, you also do the same thing. Then you write the red diary at night to say what you have learned. Have you heard something politically incorrect? You should tell us about it. Because my lesson at age seven, don't trust anybody. So I know how to write my red diary.
diaries. You just say everything political crap. I was a good writer. So my diary will be read by teachers publicly in the classroom. Look at her diary. To the point, you should model her paper. So, so that's why I move out very quick inside of my own schools because I, I write and I learn how to, I, I feel like uh, almost like, you know, in order to be successful, I just had to keep everything private to myself. And don't, don't tell anybody that you know how to write PC diaries in order to move up. But that's what you had to do in order to survive. So, but, but deep in myself, I, 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 I still keep a little bit space for myself. Like, a, I better not to say something not PC because I can get into trouble. So you learn self-censor, basically. And uh, say I told you about ugly unisex girls' hairstyle, um, because you're supposed to look like that. Um, you cannot, you cannot stand out as individual. You just have to conform with the group. And uh, and we're forbidden to date, and uh, and also forbidden to show your individual character or your actually engender special character. So. Genderless society is one of the most tactics. Like uh, we don't want to emphasize on gender. We need everybody look the same, and uh, all be loyal to party and to Chairman Mao. And uh, so there's a famous song says, "Girls don't like to look pretty. They actually want to look like boys in military clothes." Like when you say that song, uh, so so sometimes the people will say, "That's what Mao did. Good for women. Women hold." the half sky, like, oh, we are equal with men. But also, you are no longer a woman because you cannot, you know, dress like a woman, talk like a woman. Everybody call each other comrade. You cannot say, you cannot call um, special names like wife and husband. No, you call each other comrade. Hey, you are my male comrade. You are my female comrade. That's how my parents call each other. <laughs> so control the words, you know, that's what the, we were told to do. Those are the good words to use. And uh, I was a little girl here. The only entertainment we had is to dress up like minority, as I told you at the beginning, and to see dance with the traditional Chinese folk music, even though the words are still PC. Like, a, thank you, party chairman Mao, for saving us from poverty, and we're grateful, you know. And, and uh, but it doesn't matter what. I mean, like, if we can get to dress up and put a lip lipstick on, it was like party time. You know, it was great. We had fun. So we dress up like a yeast outfit here and uh, look look how oh, we are happy and innocent and, uh, and doing all those, uh, you know, party moves to say thanks, you know, tomorrow and to the party. And uh, during the Mao's Cultural Revolution that uh, uh, you probably all, all know, some very, very typical, typical destructions and tactics uh, is a uh, burn. Burn all, you know, temples and churches and religious and all cultural relics. Mao destroyed about, I think, uh, uh, I heard some uh, historian talk about in Chinese, destroyed about like a half of the cultural relics in Beijing. That's why there are some cultural relics from age-old Chinese civilization were well protected in Taiwan and Hong Kong because they did not go through Mao's Cultural Revolution, and they have better protection for those uh, items, and they're scattered around the world too. So Burnley, and this is a Catholic church. Uh, so for communism to succeed, for everybody believing in communism, they always uh, tell us you can only believe communism or other religions or cult religions. 
Did I say that right? Coat. 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 That means a new gray person, like it means they were like bad, bad. So I was so brainwashed. You know, I would go home, tell my mom was pray and for Buddha's protections, like mom, stop believing that. You know, it's like a it's not politically correct. You should not believe that cult religion. And because my mom was not party member like my dad was, and my mom was just like hold on to her little beliefs, and and, and she was always you know like religious because you know her health reason she wanted to some kind of you know blessings and and the Catholic Church had to come out to be to be forced to denounce religion, denounce Bible and God, and. Uh, Guards, say all the red guards, and they always uh, hold their face like this and chanting, like uh, you know, make you to and um, go through called uh, this is called a public struggle sessions, where you lower your head, you apologize, you be public shamed uh, um, by whatever reason. This will be public shamed by religion, but also later, if you are black class, you will be public shamed by your association. You are born into black class. Your grandparents own family factories and land, how dare you, and uh, you need to draw the line. So lots of kids were pressured to denounce their families, change last names, so they can draw the line against their families to say, my grandparents are bad, or my mom and dad are bad. I'm red now. I'm loyal to Chen Mai Mao. I'm going to change my last name. And some even regret all their life because they turned their family over to Red Guard for torture, for struggle sessions, uh, on YouTube channel, and this channel showed this Chinese man in his 60s now. When he was 16, he reported to the Chinese regime on Red Guard to say, my mom is black class. So her mom was tortured to death by Red Guards in front of his eyes. He was 16, he thought he was doing the right thing. And he never got married, he's guilty all his life, and so he goes to his mom's torture site, you know, almost like weekly, to to just apologize and to to say I'm sorry, mom, and so so his life is totally ruined, uh, ruined. And this is a professor, president of Beijing University, and Wang Yi Lun, and his title, counter-revolutionary revisionist. So anybody who disagree with any narratives or who even um, give feedback to the party, all of a sudden they become black class. So black class, red class is interchangeable. So if you are dissident or you say something, do something, and all of a sudden from red, you can be party member official and to black overnight. Then really guards just going come after you, over your back. So Mao shut down schools in colleges and, and the high schools that time at the peak of cultural revolution to do this kind of political struggle sessions full time. So if you come out as an internet you don't apologize, you don't confess correctly, then you're gonna get into trouble. Then you go to labor camps, you get the rocks right at you. So so intellectuals were they targeted. And there's a name for intellectuals called the and stinky, stinky number nine. That means uh, stinky intellectuals who dare to give feedback or challenge the party's narrative. Because the intellectuals were a educated. They know more than the workers' peasants who totally were just massively brainwashed by the party. And the Red Guards, of course, they're just urban youth. And the Mao used them to do his cultural revolution for him. And later threw them under the bus. Millions, millions of Red Guards, like my uncle, were sent to countryside. I think started in 1968 when Red Guards were become violent in the cities because school was shot down and uh, and they start to get a hold of guns 
and they start fight each other. Who is a more bigger leader? Like in Sichuan, I know there are two groups fighting each other. There's some stories about that. And uh, if you fall in love, but you are on opposite side, and that's a terrible thing. It's end up to be tragedy because you are fighting each other like enemies. So, so generals told the Mao to say, "You need to send those kids away." And uh, because they were fighting each other, and the bodies flowing down the rivers now, killing everywhere, because law enforcement were told, do not enforce any laws, and and, uh, and it was totally chaos. So, so Mao said, okay, since now I become supreme leader, I went to, he went to Beijing, and his political enemy, Liu Shaoqi, was house arrested, Deng Xiaoping was demonized, sent to labor camps, so all the people reformed inside of CCP and uh, basically to say okay we all are like a full old now we're like revisionists we're black class so we're going to labor camps and Mao went to Beijing like a god and he interviewed those, um, all the red guards in Tiananmen Square you probably saw all those pictures and those kids were crying really he was uh, like a god you know in Tiananmen and uh, hold hands like this and and were all his political enemies Enemies got house arrested for going to labor camps. So he become number one supreme leader, have positions of military chair, country's president, and communist party chairman. That's why we call him chairman. I even don't want to call Xi Jinping president because uh, those people are not elected by people. They are appointed and by the party and there are small groups to vote for them. So Chairman Mao and Chairman Xi, that's what I prefer to call. My uncle was 17. You have to send all your kids to countryside except the youngest one. So out of four children my grandma has and uh, the youngest my aunt, she stay home with parents. All my three uncles went to countryside eight years, 10 years and 12 years before they even graduate from high school. So this uncle is one of my favorite uncle. He went to Burma border near China for 10 years. Only came home once a year to visit. You get a once a year family visit time. And I saw my grandma was crying and cooking him lots of you know stuff to take with him. You know, some people say, Lily, why don't you people just not to send their kids? I said, well, you have no place to hide. And block committee, CCP block committee is in every neighborhood. Everybody knows how many children you have. What job do you have? If my grandparents refuse to send their kids, and they will be going to struggle sessions, and my grandma did for her dead husband, first husband, my real grandfather. And she dare not to lose her jobs and let the kids go. And otherwise, she will lose her job, and the whole family will be totally destroyed and you cannot protect anybody. So this uncle, 27 years old, when he come back to Chengdu, and uh, no diploma from high school, no wife, and no, in, uh, basically no money, and uh, very bitter. If you take a local wife, then you cannot come back to cities. That means household registration will be in the countryside. So that's how they track people. If you were born in city, you go to a police officer's office to get a piece of paper to say you were born here, who is on your household, use this uh, brochure, little booklet to go get the benefits. Food rationing coupons, open up bank account, go to schools, go to get a doctor's visit. But uh, if you don't have that, you are not a legal resident of the city. No freedom of movement. You cannot just pack your bag. Oh, I'm going to move to this place, that place. No, you need a permission and you need the papers. So he said, oh, those, uh, he went to Burma border. He said those Yunnan minority were so pretty. They were white minority called, it's it just named for, for the minority. And, uh, but he said, I dare not to marry one because I'll be stuck in the remote countryside of China and never come back to Chengdu, which is still urban city. You know, so so he came home finally arranged by somebody, and uh, met his wife and got married, had one daughter. You know, under child policy, one child. Uh, that generation is the most sad generation. I wish there was a Hollywood movie to make about the Red Guard generation, 
and uh, their life is totally ruined. And, uh, and my uncle is almost 70 now in China today. Uh, and when Mao died, I was 12. So 1976, here's me, and here's my good friend, and this is another friend, say, did not have a red scar on because I think her family got some issues, black class, I don't know, maybe her grandfather. But I went to visit her, they were just like us, poor and you know, hungry for food. And so if you did have a fortunes or factories or land, it doesn't matter anyway. They already took it, everything from you. But you are still guilty that <laughs> you cannot join most organizations. You cannot redeem yourself. I guess she did not come out to say, I'm going to change my last name. I'm going to throw my family under the bus. If she did that, she could wear red scarf, but she didn't do that. I I don't know where those friends are now since I haven't been to China for so long. We lost in touch. And this is downtown Chengdu. I still saw Mao statue here in downtown Chengdu, 2015. Last time I went to China, eight years ago, 2015. But it's all commercialized and, you know, under Deng Xiaoping economic reform. This is prime real estate now. And I, we were so sad. And that's the first time I told people, I start to ask a question within myself, head, how, how, did, how did Mao die? We saw that he was, like a god in motto. But he was chanting for six days a week. Long live Chairman Mao. Long live Communist Party. 10,000 years, another 10,000 years, double 10,000 years. He's going to live to one many years. How did he die? I, I was really saddened and also depressed. I started to figure out I had some brain left. I said, somebody lied to me. I, I couldn't even say that publicly, like who lied to my entire generation. And um, so that was, uh, I talk about this in my interviews a lot. That's my first turning point in my whole life. It's 12 years old when Mao died. And not until two years later or three years later, Deng Xiaoping um, took uh, over and uh, come out to say, Mao, he had to say this, Mao was a human being. <laughs> He made a mistake. Ten years Cultural Revolution was a mistake. China economy was about collapsing and people were starving. And uh, then Deng Xiaoping said, uh, let's start colleges, let's uh, um, let people get rich first. Let, let, let's start reboot our economy. So when I was, uh, um, I had a two years high school. So before I even reached 17th birthday, I had to take the intensified three days national college interest exam to pass national test in order to go to government college. Because I was so lost and depressed, but once college opened, once the party said, Mao, okay, Mao is a human being, he made a mistake. So, you know, it's like I was like a lost soul, right? But hey, I have a new goal now. My new goal is to go to the best university in China to study, to search for truth. And I choose the law to study in college, to study law, because my teacher told me, who was sick, I was 16, I visited him as class monitor, and my teacher told me, we were naive college students in the 50s. The party wants us to give feedback, called a little, like 100 flower bloom, or whatever campaign, and they trust the regime, they give feedback. As soon as you give feedback to the party to improve their policies, you give them blacklist and this were sent to labor camps. So he hurt his health, his back, and he was in bed. And he was uh, giving this long talk, non sign to say, our country is ruled by men, not ruled by law. Oh, that just clicked. It's like my light bulb come on. OK, now I know what to study. I'm going to study law in China's college so I can change. 
I can transform my country to be rule of law instead of rule of man because I know I was cheated, lied, and law was not God. So now we should have a system in place where it doesn't matter who is in the government, the system stays the same. So I was very naive, of course, ambitious, and, and uh, I passed the exam. I went to best, one of the best top five Chinese universities based in Shanghai. And before I went there, and uh, we hiked this mountain. So, so this mountain called the Ome Mountain. I had this uh, butterfly here. And that's the Ome Mountain butterfly. I think it might be I bought there or something, and I brought the United States with me. It, it's it's the native uh, butterflies in the Ome Mountain, which is a kind of a, um, it's a, it's a sacred mountain um, by the um, Buddhist. Um, so, like it's chanting Buddhas um, in the temples everywhere. And of course, that my friend had uh, his brother. Her brother had one guitar, and the were just taking turns. And after all the red sounds, after all the red music, political music, just just play the string of guitar. You sound beautiful. <laughs> I talk about this story that all the good musics were demonized. We were deprived. Twice in music. Once a day, I have one minute classic music from radio. We were too poor even to have a radio, but this classic music during the break of news, my neighbor had a radio. So I would beg to say, Can I come in very quietly? Don't bother you eating dinner. Just listen to one minute the classic music. You know, normally it's piano or something. It was just beautiful. So we actually carried this to hike in the mountains just to have the beautiful sun. Well, we did not know how to play at all. And uh, then I went to the, all of a sudden, the temples were reopened. And I guess Deng Xiaoping said, hey, let's let our life go back to normal. And uh, so all the temples were closed and Christian churches and, and you know, it's gradually they start to open up. And I, I was very excited. I'm going to leave my, ho my home for the first time in 17 years. I got my enrollment notice when I turned birthday 17 that day. I was excited. My mom cried. Said she was happy and sad at the same time. That means I'm leaving home. I'm going to Shanghai. High. It's a three days train ride in hard seat. You, know, you say like this, you know, ride a train <laughs> and to Shanghai was very slow that time. It was like 1981 when I went to Shanghai. So I was excited and scared at the same time. So I kind of asked for a um, blessing in the temple. Uh, and um, since my mom and my grandmother went to that temple, and uh, when you go to universities, I told you about household tracking and the personnel data, which is uh, also student file. So this is uh, something I got when I went to China 2015, courtesy of uh, a classmate now who, who was working for the law school as leadership, maybe vice president. We got a souvenir. This souvenir is our freshman registration. I say, perfect. Here is uh, evidence to show you how we were tracked. So how we were tracked as an individual citizen in China, as a student. This is a student file. So they ask you, always take, always take annual picture of you to show you what you look like. Because you change a lot, especially when you enter puberty. They want to know what you look like. You got to take a picture and pay by yourself, your family, and give to the um, um, school. Since I was in, you know, um, like an elementary school. And here's my information. Here's my family of four information. Look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six extended family relative information from my grandma, granddad, to my uncle's aunt. And they ask about where they work and where they live. What is their status? If they're party member or not? Are you close to them or not? And what is their monthly income? Here's the number. What is their monthly income in Chinese yuan? 
is a, are they party member or they're just math? The math means you're yeah, one of the masses. And uh, now you know why I keep telling people why Chinese people, if they can keep their head down, they just keep their head down, they cannot rise up. Because your entire family, if you are dissident in China, your entire family is at risk. They know immediately how to find you. They're all where they live, where, who, they, who they work for. And uh, they will hunt you down to overseas, even today. Like uh, Hong Kong students are being hunted overseas. They want them to go back and they put a bounty on their head. Most recently, two years ago, five student leaders in Hong Kong. How much is on their head? And you know, we want them back. And uh, I follow them on Twitter, on X. And they share all that information. And it's just, um, I guess uh, they, they believe the war is lots of them still on the China side. So they will help China. There are lots of countries have extradition laws with China. That's why I'm afraid to go to those countries because I can be extra the back. <laughs> they want me too. I'm on the blacklist <laughs> because I'm speaking truth here with you. But, you know, that's okay. I told my husband already, already since 2019 they, they, they threatened me. They have all my records. They can threaten my families, but I say I'm not going to live in fear. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm an American citizen. I have free speech here. <laughs> but they think I'm still Chinese, no matter what happened, which passport I have. I'm still Chinese because I was born there, and I was their citizen, formal national, and I can have big influence by speaking the truth. So they wanted me to shut up. So. Christmas coming up, and um, my first encounter with Santa Claus, 1982, and uh, this is me here. Like, look, I was in college, probably second year, uh, a freshman, no, junior. Oh, second year, like, a, wow, what is that? It was, you know, ho, 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 Merry Christmas, Santa come and pass out gifts. And in China, when people give you gifts, you need to think about what do they want? It's always reciprocal. You don't just take the gift. What are, you you, you got to figure out what they want from you. But I totally learned that day from Santa Claus that the gift is just the spirit of Christmas. Give to you and sharing. And, uh, and you see the girls still dress up like a people's liberation army outfit that's how we do entertainment you 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 know you dress up like that you do some she say songs and dances and and uh, but that was different so you see China is changing and when I was in college up to 85 from 81 to 85 that was the best four years of my life in China because uh, and we were doing economical reforms and they were talking about political reforms we start to drink coffee Coffee, go to go to coffee shops and talk about what kind of country we want to have as college students. So it was open discussion, debate. It was exciting time. Then you have the old and you have the new Western culture coming and traditions and and uh, and and and, and, uh, and that's the time we start to really talk loudly and publicly. It was fun time. You know, I only went home once a year when I was in college. And here's my dormitory, and six girls share one room, bunk bed, and top and down. And, uh, and there was a hallway for public bathroom, so girls' building and the boys' building are separate. And uh, we had a curfew as college students, 10 p.m. lights off. And, uh, and so you cannot sleep when you're young, you're full of energy. What do you do? We were learning dancing in the hallway, because hallway had lights. Dancing parties were banned at the beginning because it was not a political crack. But of course, as I said, as we opened up, and and the uh, shop can say, okay, let people, let people get, uh, you know, um, they can go dancing parties now. So I, I just remember that was my best fun time, just every weekend go dancing parties. And other times play cards in the school dormitory. And uh, and the best part is this day was a soccer game in China. Our men's soccer team won some major victory in Asian games. We were very patriotic. We started bonfire um, in the middle of the campus and, and chanting like a victory. And uh, I, I think that 
all of a sudden make a turn and then we'll start chant freedom, democracy. I said if you give young people a chance to start fire, whenever they will start fire. <laughs> because we're rebellious, we want to have fun, we want to gather together to make our voice to be heard. And that night, I broke my curfew. I did not go back to my dormitory until 2 a.m. But remember, 10 p.m., lights off. And, uh, and then my roommate, one of my roommates almost called cops on me to, to report I'm missing. <laughs> and uh, she waited until I showed up and lock on the door. You know, we, we did not have a key, lock on the door. And she opened the door for me, said, where have you been? I almost called cops. I said, today is my most exciting day because I protested. I mean, I protested. That means uh, we walked outside and arms with each other were calling for freedom and democracy. And uh, I came back to my dormitory with you know, very excited face and red cheeks and, and eyes shining. And, uh, and she said, yeah, you're crazy. Next time, don't, don't come home this late. And she's still in China, and I'm here. So, so you can see different students and different ideology and beliefs. And uh, of course, China become more open. We start to have a color Kodak film now. And uh, we start to have hair laid down, wear colorful clothes and beautiful, bright you know, colors. And then we'll practice dancing disco, even though we're 20 years behind the US disco. But it feels so good. OK, you can dance by yourself. You can move your body any way you say fit. I just feel like just feel good, just move my body freely with the music, or you know, very bouncing, fast music. And that was fun. You know, we, we had a great time. And of course, we had the foreigners. As I said, I went to Shanghai because I want to access to foreigners and scholars and students and know what's going on outside of China. And, uh, and, and you say, now here's me, you know, long hair now, don't have to have an approved hairstyle. And there's some European students, and uh, the American student I met was not in this picture. This is like somebody's birthday party, so with balloons and food, and now we can smile. And and uh, an American student is the one who asked me to go to his dormitory to show me something from America. And I said, what? Like, uh, I had no idea. So I went there, you have to register, who are you going to visit, what are you going to talk about it? And uh, he actually showed me a pocket constitution and read to me the first paragraph of uh, you know um, the Declaration of Independence you know he put the concept of all men are created equal you know uh, individual rights liberty into my head I and he told me look this is our Americans founding document it's a guaranteed right I was so Amazed to say, what is individual rights and liberty? And, you know, I, all I heard is collective rights, rights. You know, workers' rights, parents' rights, and and so when I went back second time to talk more to him, and. Uh, I, I become rebellious again. I said, I'm not going to register. Maybe I know I'm not supposed to talk about this with him. You know, it's political stuff. And I, I just tiptoe. And, and when the lady is uh, not paying attention, every foreign student and the uh, scholars building had a guard, had a, had a guard. that like you have to register to go and visit them. So I just refused to register, but I just cheated. When she was not paying attention, I just tiptoe upstairs and, and talked to him. Him. And so I learned more about uh, America, the Constitution, and uh, and I think uh, that's my second major turning point in my life. My light bulb came on. My light bulb came on. There's a new country called America. I will have a guaranteed individual rights. So I say someday if I have to leave China, that's the country I want to go. I don't want to go to Europe because that time, you know, I, I just don't like the kings and queens, you know. Yeah. It's like Chinese emperors, right? So the, I, I say, oh, I like this. Constitutional Republic. And uh, I become faculty member when I graduated as one of the first law school graduation class, one of the 60 students. And I tried desperate to stay in Shanghai because normally where you're from, they send you back. I did not want to go back to my hometown. More isolated, more poor, and no foreign students and scholars. 
very backward. I wanted to see in Shanghai. I tried my best to lobby the um, you know two leaders in my law school to let me stay, and one against the one for it. And uh, so I managed to stay in Shanghai as a faculty member. So I become a faculty member. I thought, oh, that's great. Now I can maybe fulfill my dream of you know uh, building China rule of law society. And at the same time, I was practice law part time. We were in need of legal professionals so bad. So. When we graduated, we did not have to take any bar exam. There's no such thing called a bar exams. Everybody who graduated from law school is a lawyer. So I become a lawyer part-time and faculty part-time. But that's when my reality kicked in. They start to tell me what to say, what to teach, and most importantly, my communist party boss. If you don't know China, every university department has a communist party committee on site. So your academic dean is your academic boss, supervise you academically, and you have a political boss, it's called a Communist Party Committee boss. To teach in law school, everybody has to join the party, and you have no choice, because law is a tool to govern the masses. That's what I was told in college. And um, then they put me on the probation status to observe me for one year to see if I'm good enough. I hated that, because remember, my light bulb came on, I just cannot continue continue to say, you know, oh, I support the party, you know, Kong Baya, Kong Baya, and I just couldn't do that anymore. So, so, so it was hard for me because my boss still make me to go to weekly political meeting, and I just stay there, look at his face, and quietly don't say anything. And uh, I got so depressed, and uh, that's like, this is my life in China for the rest of my life. I cannot say that. I'm just going to become assistant professor, professor, but whatever, you know. And uh, start to think about America. Hey, maybe I should change the course of my life. Go to this great country and um, leave China. But the problem is that if you want to leave China, quit your job. You have to get a permission. Otherwise, you're going to not get a passport. When you go to apply for a passport, you need your party permission. So I had to change my strategy, you know, and uh, sometimes when you have to become straight rat, you know, it's like a, you know how to survive, deal with your current uh, situations. I start to go to political meetings. I start to say, yes, I support party. I support everything. You know, participate. You know, you have to participate loudly, publicly, say something. You cannot just stare people into their faces or eyes. Then to butter my boss up, and then he finally, I said, well, I got acceptance from University of Texas to go to graduate school. I'm asking for his blessing, permission for me to leave. And he said, well, your recent behavior is pretty good. Uh, maybe, maybe I should uh, consider that. Remember, I'm doing that on my own time and dime. No one penny from a Chinese university or the government. So finally, I was allowed to um, quit my job, but I had to sign a contract to say, I promise go back to China as soon as I get my master's degree, serve my country. And uh, also, two consequences, if I don't kick out of party, don't care. But second one is my personnel file, household registration, all that stuff will be transferred to Chengdu, not stay in Shanghai. That was a tough one. That means if I fail in the US, I just have to go back to Chengdu, not in Shanghai anymore, which is very hard to get to. Even you have a job offer today, work in Shanghai, but if your registration household is in Chengdu, it might take you 10 years. It's very strict. From a second tier city to go to a first tier city, I had to bite my tongue, sign it, I will sign everything. <laughs> I just swear to myself, if I come out, I'm not going to go back, of course. So 1988, I made it to the United States. I was in Texas. And uh, I was very skinny, air sick. But when I made it, I was so happy, big smile, and uh, $100 in my pocket. And they limited how much money you can take out. I, I was poor, too. My, my salary as a faculty member was not much. So I borrowed my friend. That's like a 10 bucks here, 10 bucks here. I said, I'll pay you back with the interest. I'm going to go to America and get rich. <laughs> I said, well, come here. So, so I, keep, I, I raised money, $100, because Chinese yuan, you know, it was like maybe $1 equal to five Chinese yuan or something. 
So, so put money together because my parents did not have money. And then my, my American professor who sponsored me, um, so I will not become public charge since I did not have income as a foreign student. And he lent me $1,200 to buy air tickets, pay for TOEFL exam, and pay for graduate school application, pay for all the expenses. So when I started in this country, I was in the hole. <laughs> $1,200 in debt, and that was two months before my 24th birthday. You know, started late in this country, and my English was so bad, I couldn't even talk to people at the airport, you know, try, trying to get a, somebody offer me a $20 bill. I said, no, 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 I don't want it. Said, thank you, thank you. Because he saw me was dragging my suitcase, like a little young girl's heavy suitcase, said, hey, go get a buggy. I did not even understand. It's like, why is he offering me money? No, no, no. Maybe I said, oh, go get a buggy. Right, maybe five dollars or something, and I did not want to pay for that. So I arrived in Austin, Texas, and my luck just changed overnight. And I actually met my husband, John. The first night, I lock on the door of his mom, which is my graduate school dean, my sponsor's next door neighbor, go lock on the door, and I met John first night. And I was told, I got your research assistant job. I was, oh, I don't know what to do. I said, well, just check numbers. I'm a research, you know, um, organizational psychologist. Oh, I'm like, a, thank God, because I had no idea how I'm going to pay for bills, for pay for school, pay for everything, because I only had like a hundred bucks. So because that RA job, I was able to pay in situation and, and uh, work 20 hours a week. And uh, after two, three months later, I paid back the debt I owed. I remember the first time I got my American check, two months check for RA, 900 bucks. I was lying in bed, just look at that check for a long time. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's lots of money. <laughs> well, but I have to pay back my debt first. <laughs> so I, I was uh, um, stay with American sponsor, cook and clean, exchange to for free rent. And and, um, and when, when I made a job, I, there are so many first times in America. It's very, you know, I can never forget. First time camping trip, I was so scared to sleep in the tent. So like a wildness, wow. John said, well, you don't have to be scared of animals. You know, it's a human being you need to be scared of. <laughs> like, so I learned um, how to do camping in, that, in Austin, Texas. It was great. And, and uh, my first Christmas, 1988, and uh, John's parents, so they gave me a huge size Texas shirt. And uh, I got a, a stocking first time. After my encounter with Santa Claus in China, Shanghai, that was 1982. And until my real Christmas, 1988. I just shared that uh, on you know, Twitter recently. People really love that story. I said, uh, I feel so welcome. I feel like a home. His, yeah, it's his whole family are white. So what? They welcomed me. They made me feel comfortable, feel home. And uh, you know, I had a home meal. I had a real Christmas. I was always grateful for America. I think American people, no matter where they come from, they all, to me, they're the most nice and generous people. And uh, so look, I was like uh, very happy. And uh, and uh, of course, two years later, after we dated, 18 months later, we got married in uh, 1990. And uh, I was, uh, I think, uh, where my mother-in-law's dress, I learned something blue, something blue, something old, something new, right? So that's something, you know, that's American traditional saying. So I got married, and, and uh, this is a traditional Chinese dish. It's called uh, braised beef with potatoes in soy sauce. And Chen, my mom said, if we can eat this every day, then communism will be fully fulfilled. <laughs> I can eat this every day. <laughs> if I want to, it's good, but you get tired of it, you know. So, but how many people, even today, in China, under CCP dictatorship, can afford to eat this every day? Beef is very expensive, so pork is cheapest. And chicken, beef, all are expensive. I even don't think my family relatives can afford to eat this. And you know, maybe for holidays or something, special celebrations. And and uh, so that's my and Chinese family in Parker, Colorado, before we moved here four years ago. And uh, you know, Zhang and my uh, 
I said that that's my second son, my daughter, my mom, dad, and my brother, and uh, you know, and their son, his wife, and uh, we had a big Chinese New Year gathering. When you have Chinese New Year feast, it's a minimum of 12 dishes, one dish per month. So guarantee your New Year will be prosperous and happy, always have leftovers. That's why you always have a fish, because fish means leftovers, extra, means a symbol of prosperity. You're not going to be poor and starving. <laughs> so that's our um, tradition. And uh, my mom passed away 2020, and um, you know, dementia with COVID. So my dad and my, my brothers, and they are living together in Colorado. And uh, and this is a apartment, actually government uh, um, factory housing. This this unit here. We moved there when I was, uh, I think, 15. So we lived there for about two years before I left for Shanghai for college. So this is a huge improvement compared with eight families share a worker's row house back under Mao, and I lived there for 15 years. Eight families with children shared one bathroom. One big hole on the ground, and uh, when you had to go, you had to go, you had to buy a little party in your apartment and just dump it the next day because uh, everybody is fighting for that one hole, right? And this one's a two family share one bathroom, but it's got the plumbing now, so you can flush it. Because the older one's stinky, it's every two weeks peasants come to duck it out and take to the farmland to use as fertilizer. And stinky in the summer, lots of bugs, and um, it was awful. I and mean, I still have nightmares about that bathroom. In the summer, it got like worms crawling around. And I was afraid to go to that bathroom as a little girl, because in the dark, the light bulb came off. It's a community housing, who cares to put a new light bulb there, nobody. So if you are comfortable, you buy a flashlight. I do not have flashlight, so I was afraid to go to that bathroom. So that's an improvement, and but still you have to climb up, climb down, and uh, one of my um, younger brother, 17 months uh, younger than me, still, um, live there. I brought my mom dad as citizen to United States. So this does not belong to them. It still belongs to my dad's state factory. But my brother is, is able to live there with his wife because they don't have their own place. And uh, so that's the place that I lived there for two years before I left for Shanghai. And this is uh, our house in Colorado. We raised our three children there for 21 years. 21 years. So I always tell students, if they are watching this, hey, which house would you like to live in? That apartment, or a family share one bathroom, the worst one, or this one? They all want this one. <laughs> I said, well, can you tell the difference? What is the difference between free market capitalism and the socialist and communist country? I want to live here, you know, typical middle class American family, you know. We have three kids in there too, right? Three kids, and one dog, and two cars, and just, you know, you know, perfect American dream story. And we still own that house actually um, after we moved to New Hampshire. And we have a tenants there right now. And uh, so got married, raised three wonderful children. Uh, one, two, three, you know, my both two boys were American uh, veterans. They served and uh, they left. And so we raised our kids to be patriots because uh, I hammer them all the time about life in communist China. You've got to love this country, appreciate freedom you have. And uh, well, at the beginning when they're teenagers, they probably don't like this tiger Chinese mom, you know, high expectations and deep program them because I could not homeschool. I don't have money sent to private school. I got laid off year of 2000. I started my own business. And I didn't make money for eight years, so only now my husband. But I took my kids to charter school. And I become charter school board member and chair. And I made them to go to also every Sunday a Chinese um, school to learn Chinese language. So I did everything I could to educate my kids well. And uh, so if they go to a public school, when they come back, I will ask them questions. My husband and I will talk to them and uh, kind of 
you know, like uh, find out what's going on in school, but also let them to believe us, not just totally believe what they learn in school. And but we learn a lot from our kids too. You know, we had wonderful teachers and stuff. It just uh, they are not spending enough time to learn about the Constitution, and they're not spending enough time to learn about horrors of communism and socialism. That's true, it's because my kids went to charter school now, all four years high school were public high schools, regular high schools, and they're doing great. And uh, they're all of our payroll now, so we raise good children. <laughs> Nobody's dependent on us right now. <laughs> so when John and I had the chance, we moved. And, and this is the first time I voted in my life in America as an American citizen. After we went to Hong Kong for two years, lived there, and I said, hey, I take this right seriously, my voting right as an American citizen and participate in the grassroots, you know, democracy. But the politicians do not like me. Whenever I go to the town hall, ask them, can you tell me why I should vote for you instead of her? And they don't like me ask that kind of questions. <laughs> it's like, who is this woman who don't even speak good English? <laughs> but I put them on the spot to say, I want to be convinced why I should vote for you. Are you going to represent me or are you going to represent somebody else? or special interest and I you know I, I, I was very loud okay even though I did not speak good English yet but I appreciate my first voting year and I learned after you become citizen you can testify you can support or oppose a bill how wonderful is that if I have to go to government building in China there were like armed guards there to say who do you want to say you're not allowed to come in of course nobody can vote in China the um, very basic level, villagers levels, that uh, they vote for the like a villager chief sometimes can be overturned by the mobs, local mobs. It's still party rule, one party rule. And and the People's Congress in Beijing is rubber stamp, People's Congress, and the 99% nai will vote for whatever the Politburo, you know, and nominate a slate. You dare not to vote for that, your guns outside of the People's Hall, People's Congress Hall. You better vote for it. <laughs> so that's why we all voted to change China's constitution to make Xi Jinping a dictator, a permanent president, and a lifetime. He will serve until he dies, just like Mao did. Deng Xiaoping had a little bit of wisdom to say we should limit China's president to two, two terms. So that means 10 years, five year a term. And Xi Jinping overturned that. Right after that, lots of Chinese students in America to say, I need to ask for political asylum. <laughs> I don't want to go back to China. Well, I don't know if, if that can happen or not. But I testified multiple times. I practiced. I exercised my citizens' civic duty. And I'm still doing that in New Hampshire. I went to state capital conquer many times. Many times I was outnumbered. <laughs> It's okay, I'm used to that, right? <laughs> used to that. So this is four years ago, and uh, actually more than four years ago now, John and I, we dropped two trips, moved from Colorado to New Hampshire. We bought a house in Ware, 2017, had a tenants there, then we moved in 2019, right before the pandemic lockdown. I think sometimes I was lucky. I always escape something horrible on time. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like I escaped Tiananmen Massacre, 1988. One year later, Tiananmen Massacre. If I went outside to protest, I'd be in jail. And I escaped the Colorado, <laughs> the Blue Colorado lockdown. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was, we were working on our house and doing all the work. And, and uh, after f four days, 3,000 miles drive, I uh, feel so relieved to reach, to live for a die state, you know. You know, so far we really just love to live in New Hampshire. And what American dream? My dream is always have an outdoor burning Chinese rock station. And I got it. A real good Sichuan Chinese stir-fried food. 
and and uh, sometimes we have party there, and I will cook and I put on my YouTube. I have YouTube channel. You can watch my how to make a Chinese stir fry or how to make Chinese uh, home style spring rolls. So I show people. Parents, you know, gotta live life and have fun. To be honest, even though when slow is as tall as at the propane tank, I can still do stir fry because John built this very strong metal roof for me over our head. So I can go there with big jacket in the winter to do stir fry. Yeah, yeah, the food tastes not better than inside. And plus, all the smoke go out, all the grease go out, right? Yeah. And of course, at the city side, you can organize rallies and uh, and you can organize your coalitions. I am a chair of New Hampshire Aging American Coalition, nonpartisan. We want to voice for ourselves. If we love this country as immigrants, we want to voice ourselves. We don't want anybody else to speak for us. So we organize rallies, and I think Peter came to that rally. And if you want to recommend young people, what book is good to read? about the Mao's Cultural Revolution. I will re recommend this young adult book. You can check out libraries, buy one very cheap, Red Scarf Girl. And I was crying reading this book because it brought about lots of memories from my childhood. And she suffered even more. I was a red child, and she was a black child. Think about black child life stories during that time. It was total misery, you know, total depressing. And another good movie to watch, and it's called uh, To Live. I think this movie might be banned in China now. And talk about somebody from a rich um, family all of a sudden become a poor, then cultural revolution happened. He was lucky to be alive because a guy who, because he gambled, like her husband gambled with a family fortune a house, you know, lost to the somebody. And somebody else got that house, got shot by the regime. He said, that could be me if I still own that house. So after communists take over China, I don't know that China before communism, 1949, I had to learn all that about, oh, what is it, oh, China's like before communism. But all I know is my personal experience 24 years in China. So I remember, you know, this movie showed me even how bad it is for people, you know, who lost everything, who lost family members. They, they land reform, 1950s, like a Mao killed too many land owners because they were bad. You got to redistribute the land. That's why the Chinese people, peasants, supported communism because he promised, we're going to give you land, we're going to give you, no, nothing was given to them. After Mao took over land, killed too many landowners, Utopia never came. Actually, parents were told, now you go to have a people's commune. So everybody equally owns something, but nothing, because land today is owned by state. They call it owned by people on, in the Constitution, but it's people means a state. So they own the land, but the land business was very corrupt. So the government can rent to you as developer land 70 years or 50 years. Then you build apartments, and people buy your apartments on top of this land. So there are lots of dealing going on. If you are well connected, Chinese Communist Party official issues at top level, you make a fortune just by controlling China's natural resources from land to diamond to earth, like a real earth minerals and all that stuff. You know, that's why corruption is really bad. So most people, regular people like my family do suffer. Their life relatively is still better than under Mao, but still with high inflation, it's hard to keep up with all the costs. And you don't have money, you don't have connections, you don't have special privileges. So it's all the top political 1% ruling class control all the power, all the natural resources. And their family members get rich, not my family members.
It's a good movie and to watch, a very sad movie. So if you like my stories, and please, uh, you can go contact me and uh, check out uh, my information. I have been speaker for the Victim of Communism Memorial Foundation for six years. I do go to middle school, high school, colleges, and uh, charity clubs and everywhere to tell my stories. I think it's uh, so important for me to give back to the country I love and to give back to the community I love and uh, so here I am because I feel like uh, we don't have enough people like me doing this kind of uh, public screen work to educate people. So I hope victory, I mean like the history will not repeat itself and especially now today in America. So thank you very much for, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now it's a uh, fun time. Que question answers and, and uh, there's no PC, right? So if you ask me a question, I will repeat your question because uh, um, I have the mic, you don't have the mic, and Peter from the community TV can and record it. But we will not show your face at all, so don't worry. <laughs> hey, I'm not worried if I have the whole, you know, Chinese Communist Party watching me. <laughs> I put me out there, whenever they threat me, I'm gonna just put up publicly to call them out. So I, I think that um, we are Americans, you know, and we should be the courageous people, right? <laughs> yeah. And thank you, Kerry, for ha having me and hosting me. Yeah. Any questions about my presentation? What shocked you, you know? That's different from what you heard. Yes. I have one. <laughs> so when you learned that such a early age not to trust anyone, in my mind, I think that you already knew that you really didn't believe in what they were doing. Even though you went through the motions and treated like a community like God, like yeah. I think that you realized that that was the truth. So her, question, her comment is that uh, once I said, uh, realize I cannot trust anybody in China, maybe I did not really trust it, what they're telling me, feeding me. It is true, because my husband always called me, even though you were young pioneer, red guard, later become communist party member, but I really don't believe it. But I had to join it in order to survive, to become successful, but I have a little something in the back burner to say, you know, it's hard for me to buy into that. But that's how sad it is. What you believe privately, you know, you cannot say it because you don't have free speech. You cannot express your thought if you don't have free speech. So you keep your thoughts to yourself. Look at those pictures I show you. If everybody knew I was keeping my private album to keep my life stories in an album, that was not political correct lifestyle. So come this life style is don't be a human, don't be sentimental, don't keep track of life stories. You should totally focus on the regime, focus on the political agendas. It is totally not human against humanity. I guess uh, my husband always say, I think you were born kind of like American, but you did not know it. <laughs> and that's why I feel like at home here, it's like a, I just really cannot buy into that but I want to have fun, I want to look pretty, I want to eat good food, I want to love my family, I, I want to go to my temples, so what's wrong with that? But no, you had to comply. So, so now, can you imagine this country, they ask me, shut up, because uh, we're going to threaten you, we're going to do this or that, you know. Why should I be living fear today in a free country? I, mean, I choose not to. There are lots of Chinese Americans in this country are still afraid to speak up because they track you. TikTok, WeChat, Chinese spies, they track you. Well, I don't know who is talking to me in New Hampshire. You know, since New Hampshire had a Confucius Institute on UNH campus for many years. So that means there are people are here. They work for Chinese government. So I always tell my neighbor, just watch out for me, okay, I'm talking. <laughs> but I, I feel safe in New Hampshire. We are live free or die, and we have a constitution to carry. That's good. <laughs> well, good luck come to my driveway. Yeah. <laughs> so 
I feel like, you know, sometimes you just have to speak up. You know, otherwise you just live on your knees. You're always living fair, and that's how they can manipulate you and control your thoughts and control your speech. You know, yes. Well, it's kind of related to the uh, prior comment, and I'm wondering at what point. I mean, when you were younger, you must have basically believed that you were talking about how you were impacted by Mao's death, learning he wasn't a god. Was that the point, or was there a point where you started to feel inside that you know what you're being taught was true? Well, we were not taught the real science, so so going through government schools until Mao died, all those years, I believed. I never asked that question, is Mao immortal or not? We just going through motions. I never to my mom, yes. We cried when we chant. We dance, we say songs. You're supposed to have tears come out. That's how much you are indoctrinated. It's very powerful, semi-religious experience under that kind of propaganda brainwash. I never challenged. As I'm saying, I was head like a, my mediator when he died. I said, what happened? And of course, my parents were illiterate. They could not answer my questions. They were less educated than me because they couldn't even read the Chinese. At least I read, read in schools and read Chinese. I loved to go to libraries. The only fun I had, I had no toy, I had no radio. The only fun I had was going to library to read. I loved to read foreign novels, fictions, translated into Chinese language, and uh, even the poems. And uh, but, but I truly believed that uh, Mao and the party I never challenged, I never ask a question. I just did not like them to tell me I cannot look pretty, I cannot date. I had a crush on this boy in middle school and I dare not to say anything to him. But of course, later you forget about it, you move to the next stage of life, and, but he just could not do, and, and talk about real oppression, oppressive regime, you, you, as a human being, you're just totally oppressed. You couldn't speak, you couldn't dress the way you want, you, you could not express the love you want, and uh, you just have to be careful. Everybody's whispering. <laughs> Even in your neighborhood, right? It's like make sure nobody's listening and whisper each other. And I remember when the adults get together in our neighborhood, I mean, they were talking about some stuff. Like when Premier Zhou, Zhou Enlai died, they were, and I, I asked question as a kid, go, 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 go away, go away. They sent me away, they don't, don't bother the adults' conversations. They, people were afraid. So I think uh, when I was 12 years old, that was the first time I got hit really hard. Then second time in college when they told me, law is just tool to govern the people. It's not for justice. So I was depressed and lost again. I went to dancing parties and talked to foreign students. And when the foreign student told me about America, and that was like a third point. Then come to this country, my another major point is 20 years later, I become an independent thinker. <laughs> 20 years. When you were in doctor lifetime, you would take that long. Even with my husband, American husband's help, you know, who understand the history, and uh, say that you were born in you need to come out of that old mentality. Government is not your solution. Because I would say, government should do this, government should do that. I'm talking about in U.S. And he told me, no, you're still being born you read some other books. And I start to read other books. I start to read uh, also China, know what happened during Mao. And I had to relearn China history. Besides learning about American history, and, and, and uh, like a free to choose, you know, um, free market capitalism, I had to relearn all that. And then when I start my own business, I had to learn actually how to practice, practice free enterprise. And that's how we are able to, you know, jump able to retire earlier than we moved to New Hampshire because uh, eventually my self-employment business becomes successful so I could have second choice to move to New Hampshire. You know, Colorado is, is, is just uh, not what I thought used to be. It's, it's, it's finished. I said, uh, I always chase freedom. I think I see New Hampshire live free or die. The state constitution is like a home. And plus it's beautiful here. I came here eight times before I moved here to change 
check out the places and I went to universities, gave talks on college campuses and uh, I just love this place. It's like a, you are so different. Why well, you are so different in terms of all New England states, you know? And, and New Hampshire people are wonderful. I mean, I'm not supposed to, you know, like uh, buy into those narratives, you know, because I know better, you know, when, when, when they talk about, oh, why did you move to a very white state? <laughs> I was by my Chinese friend, a very little Chinese there. I said, well, I should stay in China there if I want to stay where Chinese are, right? So I'm chasing freedom. This is a great state, you know? So, so that I, I think that um, that question was very valid. It's, I, I truly believed it. And that's why I was so sad. I cried my eyeballs out when Mao died for at the beginning and then I started to ask questions, you know? It's kind of sad when you think about, yeah. Other questions? And we have a younger student here, 15. Do you have a question? No? Do you learn this from school? No. Yes? So I'm just curious about the dynamic where you were able to go to a school where there, there were foreign students. So in my line of thinking, given how China was, they might be afraid that you and others would have foreign influence. You would hear about other places and maybe begin to think differently. So how was it that there were foreign students allowed to go to school in mm -hmm. the country? Good. And also what were their motivations for, for foreign students coming here? Or might you know of what those were? So her question is that, uh, what are the motivations for um, China to allow foreign student scholars coming to college campus? And, uh, and what are the purpose of those foreign scholar students? Um, I, I don't know about the foreign student scholars motive, but I can tell you that time China, as I said, under Deng Xiaoping, is going through some kind of you know, opening up, and they want to, um, after, after Deng Xiaoping said, uh, we are going to allow foreign investment come in. We're going to reboot China's economy. Opening up, that's his policy. Opening up, we all supported it. it. was great. That's why we had the Kodak film. I was able to go to dancing parties. And, 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 and where are the top five you know, universities in China, especially in Shanghai? You know, it's an international commerce trade center. So maybe some other universities in that did not allow foreign students that early but the, my university did. So I start to see them also come to dancing parties too. And uh, But uh, they are being watched um, if they go to student dormitories. That's why their dormitories were protected by a guard. They're not an open door invitation <laughs> for you to go. Foreigners are the special protected group. So if we want to go visit them, they want to know what are you going to talk about? Who are you going to visit? What is my country? information and their name time in and time out very very still you know tracked police state and uh, we learn better like um, we better not invite them to our dormitories and they would be I don't know what the rule is but for us to go there without registration I did break the rule because I did not want to be tracked like uh, why do I want to talk to this foreigner you know and couple of times and uh, I don't want to tell them we're talking about America and individual rights. No, that's not a right to say, right? And, and uh, so I think uh, I, I enjoyed the China that time. Be honest with you, today's China, it's more backward even from that time. Because today's China under Xi Jinping dictatorship, it's almost like a Cultural Revolution 2.0. He banned lots of foreigners teaching English now in China, shut down their, those uh, business, and uh, he thinks that the Chinese don't need to learn English anymore. And um, and also, all those foreign influence is bad for China. He's a very, like Mao, ideology control, 
and anti-America sentiment, anti-West sentiment is very strong. And the anti-also capitalism, that's why China economy is weak today, because um, he wants more centralized power and control, therefore shut down more and more huge private industries. Remember Jack Ma? Billionaire disappeared for a few months, and he was forced to resign. He was forced to give to charity billions of dollars, <laughs> and his company was disallowed to go public in Hong Kong exchange and the US. I don't know what he's doing now. He said he will go back to his old profession, which is teacher. He started as teacher. And because of the China's economic reform, he become billionaire. He's a very smart man, hard working. But he violated the fundamental number one rule. He dared to criticize China's regulators' economical policy. After that, just like, so that's why I always tell people, if you are capitalist, billionaires, even in the United States, and you still really trust that China to business there is a safe way to invest, you should maybe ask Jack Ma for advice. <laughs> to say, you know, how, well, when Xi Jinping come to California, I talk about that. It's for his domestic propaganda and the world propaganda. Look, we are legitimate government. Look how many people come to shake hands with me. Governor Newsom, billionaires and CEOs of big corporations. And without talking about any of the human rights abuse issues. How about Uyghurs, cultural genocide? I mean, they already announced like several Western countries to say China is conducting cultural genocide with the Uyghurs. And how about the Muslim countries don't call them out when they do business with China? If you think about it, you should care about those Muslims, human rights. No, it's people, you know, sometimes, you know, I understand private people want to make money, want their stock values to go up. But for me, you know, for me, the liberty, freedom, human rights is more important. Because if we all live under communist rule, doesn't matter how much money you make, it's not safe. It's, Overnight, you're gone, you disappeared, and we just freeze your assets. So we still have to have rule of law. We need to have human rights protections. And I'm hoping that nobody consult with me, I'm just nobody, so, so I'm just trying to educate people by speaking and tell my stories, you know. And um, it's a good question. Yes? How, what good sources are there now for learning about what's going on in China? Um, what is a good source about learning um, what's going on in China? Um, for somebody who don't speak Mandarin Chinese, and I go my direct source, which is a value part of my message and stories. But uh, I will suggest you to, um, I think the Epoch Times is a good source on China because they have a Falun Gong practitioners inside of China to supply them first-hand information. Remember, Falun Gong were the meditation group who were demonized and banned in the 90s and uh, estimated about one million of them disappeared in China into dark prisons and uh, some of them were used for organ harvesting, crime against humanity, and but they're still their practitioners in China, privately practice and uh, give information. And with modern technology, you mean you can still bypass China's internet firewall to get information out. I don't know how they do it. Maybe they have app or they have they pay VPN and you cannot crack down. You know, lots and lots of people. And uh, so Epoch Times is a good one. And they, they, they are bilingual. They have a Chinese newspaper versus English. They also have a TV, NTD TV. They interview me, me many times. I went to their rally in Washington, D.C. last July when all their loved ones disappeared and they come out and march with their pictures to say, uh, and some of them just like probably got killed for the um, organs. And, and so every year they do this. Um, and uh, I think that uh, there's some, a couple of YouTubers, they're good. And YouTubers, I want to warn you, some YouTubers look like America, 
they're working for Chinese government, or they get paid by CCP for propaganda. So their YouTuber is all about the, you know, counter strike other side of voices to say how wonderful China is. Other people cannot tell, think this guy is neutral, talk about how great China is if you don't know the truth. But I can tell, oh, that guy is taking money from CCP. You know, just like a, you know, you, you, you should know there are some social media companies and, and, and some companies, you know, they all have their narratives. And, and if you take money from like a Chinese companies, they support you or they give money to universities, then you are kind of careful what, about what you are trying to say on college campuses. And um, so knowing your source is very important. I always encourage people trying to find your own reliable news source and uh, legacy media, corporate medias and the social medias. Uh, and you can still read about them, but just just don't trust 100%. And trust but verify. I have learned that over the years. Trust but verify. But I read everything, I watch everything. But I know certain people I trust and certain people I don't trust. But you have to judge it yourself. That's why my husband said, oh, you don't talk to me anymore. Every day you are, you are like a folks on all the news and stuff, like uh, give a life or something. But for the same though, I want him to understand. That's my interest. I don't want history to repeat itself. I want to keep my eyes on CCP and their infiltration into our country. Of course, I got to pay attention. Because I have self-interest now in this new country and in New Hampshire. And I don't want to relive ever my first 24 years under totalitarian regime. So that's where you get it. I have interest. And I tell my children, I'm fighting for you, three kids. You know, you, know, you, you better get prepared. And, and, and uh, you know, since I'm a targeted, I ask my kids, you know, try not to be so publicly about the whereabouts and stuff like that. And, and be careful, because uh, I still want them, you know, to have a regular life and careers and stuff. But my husband and I are wanted the criminals by CCP. <laughs> so John and I have no choice because we go out everywhere, you know. <laughs> and uh, and that, that, that's okay. I'm a, I, I, I feel pretty safe in New Hampshire already. Yeah. Yes. Did, did your family suffer any repercussions as a result of your leaving China? Did my family suffer the consequences um, because I left in China? And no, because when I come here one year later, the Tiananmen Square massacre happened. And just remember, Tiananmen massacre, 1989, June 4th, were all banned were to search on China's internet. But because of that, I think a Chinese students lobbied the um, federal government to give political refugee status to all the, probably about 200,000 Chinese students here, and they all got a green card status. And that's why sometimes the kidding my husband's like, just remember I married you not because of your green card, because I couldn't get a green card from the political asylum status. <laughs> or because sometimes the old family argues like, oh, it's like the movie green card, right? You marry American citizen, get a green card, so you can stay. I would be married for 33 years, so it's like, a, yeah. So, so all the, so because of that, I was able to go to China. I think I went there 2000. 1990, I think the first time I went back to China was uh, um, which year I took you to China? 91. 91. I was pregnant with our first baby, and uh, and uh, and Jiang showed up, and he got he got his most cultural shocking experience. Three months in China. Think about. An uh, American guy never went to China before. All of a sudden, three months in China, live like Chinese, and eat food like Chinese. Stay with my mom, dad's apartment in China. He was totally culture shocked. <laughs> but he saw the Chinese people wonderful. They always say hello, offer him free food. They want to touch him. him. <laughs> and and uh, when I first time took him to China, I was still very poor, and I was pregnant. And they saw him. We were poor too, so we had to take a bus not taxi everywhere. So he would block the public uh, bus to let me to go under his arm to take a seat because I couldn't stand in the bus for a long ride. So he had to block other guys. And this Chinese guy tried to push him, push him. I said he just pushed him a little bit. That guy was on the floor. 
<laughs> and he was a man, he was laughing. He said, is this your husband, washing husband? I said, why washing? Because they're poor? And I said, no, he's poor American. <laughs> it's not everybody in America is rich. That's their concept. The Russians are poor, but Americans are rich. No, I said, we're poor graduate students. I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got to have a seat. So he's trying to protect me, get a seat. So he traveled, lived like Chinese. And uh, I mean, that was just totally shocking experience for him. But we went to lots of parts of China. And so we, he loves China and Chinese food and Chinese people. And it's just the uh, Chinese government is really bad. It's not even the Communist Party members, Uyghur people are bad. It's the leadership because they want the power and the control. And they don't care about their own citizens. How can they care about world environment if they don't even don't care about their own people? So it's like a trust issue, right? So so I can't say one people, hey, you know, it's okay if you want to do business with China, make money. Just keep something in your back burner. You cannot totally trust them, you know. Yeah. Can I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the library. I do have a silly little question. Yeah. Are New Hampshire mountains adequate? <laughs> Well, we're from Colorado. Remember, Colorado Rocky Mountain is very high. What is, is New Hampshire mountain adequate? What I love about New Hampshire, it's not just you got the mountains, you also got the ocean, and got lots of rivers and lakes, and everybody is living in the world with lots of open space. I, feel, I, 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 just, I told John, out of all the states, this is the most beautiful state I live in. It's, it's my style, yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, I feel so safe to drive here. When I go back to Colorado, I, I was afraid to drive. There's so many people in cars. <laughs> and uh, of course, White Mountain is beautiful, and I love the big tall trees, and, and um, very, very adequate. It's uh, most important to me, it's uh, still the system, the spirit, and the people. So I think uh, I found the right place, live free or die state. And uh, actually, my husband's family and ancestors were buried in Charlestown, New Hampshire. I had no idea actually connected with his ancestors here who came here from Maine Flower, you know, to Massachusetts, to New Hampshire. I don't know what it is. I just always tell my husband, we come to the right place called home now. And so I run out of place to go. <laughs> I don't know where else I can go now. <laughs> you know, left to Colorado, left to Texas, and, and left to China, and Hong Kong, and uh, so, I just want to show my gratitude for the people of New Hampshire who welcome me. I've mean, been here for four years, and no matter what other people say, you know, but I do believe most people have some so much in common in humanity, and uh, I, I want to tell people, you know, truly really to be happy and to be united in our state. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, appreciate it. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Have some fortune cookies and uh